Let's open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 10. And for the next few minutes, I would like to share with you what, after many, many weeks of study, has become for me one of the most fascinating chapters in the Bible. The key to the past history of this planet Earth is the Bible. And the key that unlocks all the mysterious past events in human history is God's Word. And the key that opens the vistas, not only of the past, but of future history, which details the destiny of planted, the planet Earth as it hurdles toward a very sure future is, of course, God's Word. Across the face of our world, there seethes ethnic rivalry. We read regularly in the newspapers about genocide. We see the ancient hatreds, religious warfare, regional warfare. The question we must ask ourselves is, where did the races and nations come from? From the nationalism that rises in the Balkans to the Orient, to the terrorists who seek to cause a concession to gain their independence in the Basque country, Northern Ireland, the Palestinian areas, and all other hot spots of the world. How did all that start? Where did the seething differences come from when God made one man and from him made one woman and from one blood made all peoples? Well, the scriptures in Genesis 10, give us the birth of the nations. And so the Bible is the key to the present, which is written in God's word in the past. As we open to perhaps the most fascinating chapter of the Bible, the table of nations, we find God's map for all the human family. We find the ultimate genealogy, all of our relatives and all of the Relatives of every nation and kindred and tongue and tribe on this planet find their family tree in just one chapter of God's Word. As we look over these 32 verses tonight, I trust you'll come to the same conclusion that I have, namely, that the Bible's explanation of where national and tribal origins come from, I hope you'll see it's far superior the Bible's definition, than any evolutionary idea. The Bible is superior both morally and genetically. The Bible explains where the differences came from. You notice, and you will notice tonight, there's no concept in this chapter of race at all. Only languages. That's interesting. Peoples, languages, tribes, Nations. Now listen, the most important difference between groups of people on this planet is not their skin color. The dividing line is their language and the culture that evolved around that language. Therefore, the language barrier, which we will see next time and the next time when we look at the Tower of Babel and, and Abraham's world, only the language barrier, which enforced an isolation and thus produced an inbreeding among language groups. I mean, people always wonder, how do you have such diversity on this planet? I mean, everybody who has been involved in genetics knows that if you isolate a subgroup and inbreed that, you can have an incredible variation of the species within the species. And so what we see, humanly speaking, is the enforced isolation that chapter 11 brings, the Tower of Babel, the inbreeding among those who were in the language group, that produced the many distinctive physical characteristics that accompany the language of the various groups. So this passage is a wonderful insight into God's sovereign and eternal purposes. But you know, since there are 70 names in this chapter, nothing really that's very exciting, I thought for our text we ought to open to Isaiah 40, which is along the same line. So now turn with me to Isaiah 40, and when you get to Isaiah chapter 40, I'm going to give you the 10 most vital verses that explain what God's doing in Genesis 10. Isaiah chapter 40, and I'm going to give you the 10 greatest verses on the majesty of our great God who writes history in advance. And I trust that you will agree with me. Isaiah 40, first of all, verse 8, The grass withers, the flower fades, 
but the word of our God stands forever. Verse 12, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, who has measured the heavens with a span and calculates the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in the scales and the hills in a balance. Only God is the answer. Verse 15, look at this. Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust on the scales. All of human history, all the nations, all the United Nations, all this planet is nothing like but dust on a scale. Look, he lifts up the isles as a very little thing. Verse 18, to whom then will you liken God and what likeness will you compare to him? Of course, the answer is none. Verse 22, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth. And its inhabitants, all the 70 nations plus, us included, are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Remember, we studied that in our creation study. God rolled, he unrolled the heavens, kind of like your tent or your sleeping bag when you go camping. And that speaks of the earth being the center of the universe, and from it God rolled out the endless expanse of the cosmos. Look at verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. Who brings out their host by number? And the answer is he who calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. Verse 29. The same one who is so great gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Verse 31, and those, or but those who wait on the Lord, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, chapter 41, verse 4, who has performed and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? Here's the answer. I, the Lord, am the first. And the last, I'm he, and chapter 10 is him mapping out the generations. And finally, the conclusion is verse 10 of chapter 41. Fear not, for I am with you, the one who is bigger than all the earth, bigger than all the nations, unrolled the heavens. He says, I'm with you. Don't be dismayed. Whatever's going on in your little world that's dismaying you, I am your God. I want to get in your world, he says, I will strengthen you. I will help you. I, who hold the stars, will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I believe the reason we should study Genesis 10 is what Isaiah 40 and 41 say. It reminds us how great is our God. Let's bow before him in prayer. Father, I pray that the details of history will only affirm to us how great thou art. O Lord, our God, how great thou art. Teach us that as we look at how you have mapped out the past, how you're accomplishing the present, and how you hold in your omniscient omnipotence the future. We entrust ourselves to you, and we pray that you will fill us with such faith that we will not be dismayed and we will not fear no matter what happens on this planet because you stand with us and you uphold us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to uh, summarize and go back to Genesis 10. We're going to cover all 32 verses, uh, even if I have to go at 78 speed, okay? Do you remember when you were little? Some of you aren't old enough, but when I was little, they used to have those 16 and a half. And I don't know, 33s and then 45s and then 78s, or maybe there's something else in between. And I used to always love to crank it up to 78 and have it really go fast, you know, and got the song over quick, okay? That's what I'm going to do with chapter 10. But I hope, and if you have a pen, I hope you'll get it and mark, because chapter 10 will never be the same once you see some of the patterns that are in there. But if I could summarize all of the Bible up through chapter 10, it would be this, that God created... Adam and Eve, Adam and from Adam, Eve. They had two sons. The two sons became two lines, two families of peoples, Cain's family 
of those who did not seek the Lord and Abel's family of those who did seek the Lord. Abel was cut off, murdered by his brother, so he was replaced. And Cain uh, had another brother, Seth, who became the father of the godly line. And so those two lines go on until their culmination when the last descendant of Cain and the last descendant of Seth are on this planet. And the last descendant of Seth, as far as the patriarch, was Noah. And God takes Noah and his wife into the ark, and they have now three sons. And so God starts over again with another couple. As Adam and Eve started the earth to the flood, God starts over again with another couple, Noah. And Noah's three sons start three more lines or families of people. And we'll see that they basically are the three groupings of the different civilizations in the eras that they have risen up. But in those three lines, God especially chose for his covenant purposes one group, Shem. Remember Shem, Ham, Japheth. Shem, the Semitic people. In fact, the, the Bible was written, the two-thirds of it at least, in a Semitic language. The descendants of Shem are the Jews. And many other people, the Arabs, are too, uh, by and large. But God chose one line, the Semitic line, and from that, he kept on in that line till he came to one man, who we're going to get to next time, whose name was Abraham. And from that man, who had two sons, he picked, again, one son, Isaac, the son of promise. And through that one son of promise, he, again, had two sons, and he diverges, again, down another line to a son of promise, Jacob. And from that, there are 12 sons of Jacob, and he picks one, again, which is Judah. And then God zeroes down that line. There's no more breaking in the line, and it goes all the way down through David to Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ opens up the blessing to all the sons of Noah, a potential of salvation to all. Because in the seed of Abraham, through Isaac, Jacob, and Judah, to Jesus Christ, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. It's a very beautiful picture of God's sovereignty. Well, let's look at it. Genesis 10, as far as the early nations are concerned, tells us there are three major groups of nations that naturally stem from the three sons of Noah. This chapter lists 70 nations, and it extends to sometime soon after the scattering of the people from the Tower of Babylon. We're going to see that supernatural event next time. In general, this is what the table shows. From verses 2 to 5, the Japhetic, or the descendants of Japheth. Now, some of this is going to amaze you, uh, how, how Japheth shows up all the way around the cultures we're aware of, our Western cultures. And, and, and it amazes me when you study all this. Secondly, starting in verse 6, uh, by the way, Japheth's descendants migrated to Europe. And so that would be where many of our backgrounds would come from. Those of Ham uh, went southward into Africa. That's verses 6 through 20. And then those of Shem, from verses 22 to 32, remained in Western Asia. Now, there was a lot of migration. Remember, uh, next time we'll see this, because of immediately after the flood, there were the Ice Ages, there was a, a coming down of uh, an approaching and encroaching sheet of ice that Job saw. Job describes it. He says he saw the waters frozen hard like rock, and he saw the, the treasuries of the frost. He saw this ice age, and so the people would retreat away from that, and the southern uh, civilizations advanced more rapidly at first than the northern because of the climate and all the hardships and everything else. But all of that's reflected. Although it's not certain, it seems probably the Far East was later settled by some of the Hamitic tribes and some of the Japhetic uh, nations. In other words, some of the Europeans swung over the top and, and uh, went into uh, the Orient area, and some of the Hamitic tribes went across the south and also did that. And you can see that in some of the migrations. Well, what are the origins of the nations? Well, the Bible clearly teaches in the 10th chapter of Genesis that all present nations, tribes, and languages have been derived from Noah's three sons and his three daughter-in-laws in a very few thousand years. In fact, uh, yesterday at sunset was the beginning of year 5762 for the Jewish people. They mark New Year's on Friday night of last week to Saturday night or Saturday sunset, 
and that's their new year, and it was year 5762. So they say that 5,762 years ago, God created the earth. They count, they count from creation, the Jews. They say, hey, it's our God that made the world. We're counting from the beginning. And so they say we're in year 5762, which is interesting for them to, to come up. I'm not sure how they got that number. But in those few thousand years, approximately 4,000 plus since the Great Flood, all the different groupings of people have come from the three families that got off the boat with Noah. However, it might be questioned whether some extreme variations in the physical and linguistic characteristics could develop so rapidly. It's because at the Tower of Babel, there was a, and we'll see this next time, there was a forced isolation. God supernaturally, it seems that everyone spoke the same language until Babel. And that language was what Noah and his sons were speaking. And they, they seemed to have clustered initially around the area of Babel, but then God supernaturally isolated them in language groups. They could not marry outside of their language groups very easily because they couldn't understand each other, and so they began to migrate off in language groups. And it's interesting when computer models, recently the um, USA Today uh, published a study that when you take a computer and you do linguistic and philological studies and try and, and go backward, in, in the study of the, of the probabilities of where words come from, it shows that all the languages seem to link back together into, of all things, a Mesopotamian, which would be the Tower of Babel type of setting. So it's another time that science kind of backs its way into the Bible. But here's what's really interesting for us. Several major European royal genealogies, which are found in the archives of the major European nations. If you go there and if you study as one man, Dr. Bill Cooper did, he did his doctorate and became an archivist and going as a historical student and went into their archives and this is what he found. He found that several European royal genealogies traced all the way back to Noah's son Japheth and to the list we're going to read tonight with no knowledge of the Bible with no trying to, to reckon. I mean, some of those archives, they don't even acknowledge the Bible in those countries, but they actually, in their records, go back. And so this is another evidence that points us who love God's word back to the fact that true ancient history always will correspond with the Bible because the Bible is God's inerrant word. And as I said, Dr. Bill Cooper of Middlesex, England, in 1995, after spending 30 years writing his dissertation from 1965 to 1995, wrote his dissertation and published it. It's called After the Flood, and it's a genealogical record of 30 years study. And he compiled it through extensive research, and all of his notes going back to Shem, Ham, and Japheth, you can find in the archives of the national libraries from Britain across to Germany. Fascinating. Well, let me read to you uh, the conclusion of his dissertation. It's quite boring, if you ask me, but this is his conclusion. When I applied the table of nations, that's chapter 10 of Genesis, to the healthy historical research of the various nations and their libraries, surprisingly, in light of what most commentaries go to such great lengths to assure us, namely that Genesis is not to be trusted as accurate history, was false. Now, what is he saying by that? Well, if you read most commentaries on the Bible... I'm talking about, you know, these scholarly commentaries. If you look up Genesis 10, what they say is that it's not an accurate historical record of the nations. It's rather kind of biblical, Jewish kind of uh, uh, symbolism or something, and you can't trust it. But he took, and, and his premise was, he took the 70 nations that are listed in this 10th chapter, and he went and, and went to the National Libraries of Europe to study Japheth, and he found Japheth and all of his sons recorded in their records of especially the Roman conquest. When the Roman Empire came up to, to conquer the, the barbarians, they found nations named after what we're going to see here. Just amazing. So over the years, little by little, his testimony and his dissertation is the pieces came together as he looked at the libraries of Europe the Middle East, the Mesopotamian records, the Arabian records, the Egyptian records, the records in Turkey, and even he studied in Greece. 
and this picture build up that revealed the 10th and also the last part of the 11th chapter of Genesis, and here's his conclusion, to be an astonishingly accurate record of the families and tribes of mankind. Isn't that amazing? And he, of course, got his doctorate and he published it. Well, let's start with chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. We're going to look at the Japhetic or Japhetic races. Those are the descendants of Japheth. It says in verse 2, the sons of Japheth were. Let me read them to you. Because God, as he dealt with mankind, saw to it that the, the nations, the tribes, the races were dispersed over the globe. But he confounded the human speech at Babel. He intended to force nations apart, hastening them to be distributed over the face of the planet. The table of nations starts with Japheth, and that's in verse 2. Very briefly, I'm only going to go over a few names, but this is what's fascinating. If we look just at this first one, this is, by the way, our ancestry. I'm talking about the major European immigrant blocks to America. Most of them date back to this Japhetic uh, son, Japheth, of Noah. But this is what history records. Japheth is regarded as the father of many peoples in the Indo-European archives. You say, like who? Number one, the pagan Greeks perpetuated his name as Iapetas. If you look at the Greek archives, who they feel their forefather was, they call him Iapetas. Well, you know why? It's because they don't pronounce the J. If you take Japheth and don't make the J hard, you have Apheth, and they just transliterate it into Iapetas. So the Greeks talk about this son of heaven and earth who became the father of many nations called Iapetas. <laughs> who better than Japheth, who stepped off the ark, almost like from heaven, because he came from nowhere as far as they're concerned, and came to be their forefather. Also, in India, uh, in the Vedas of India, it appears in Sanskrit as Prajapati. So the people of India feel that their great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather is this Japati guy. Interesting. Iapetos, or Japetos, of the Greeks, and Japati of the people of India. In the Romans, they perpetuate their father of their culture as Jupater. Now, what's that? Jupiter, king of the gods came down from somewhere to earth and started the nations. They call him Jupiter, Jupiter, or Japheth. Father Jove is another standardization, but finally they settled on Jupiter. Also, the Irish uh, Celtic people, the early Britons, and other pagan European races trace their royal houses to Japheth himself. By the way, the city on the coast of Israel... The first stop for every Holy Land group that goes over there is the town of Japheth, which they call Jaffa, after Japheth. Does it ring a bell? Jonah sailed from Joppa. Peter, Cornelius, the, the whole deal is in the town of Japheth. You see, all these people lived in a very small area. In fact, I'll share with you a little later what the Jews think, who they identify Melchizedek as. They consider Melchizedek from the Bible to be the oldest man on earth in his time who was none other than Shem himself living still in Jerusalem. Very interesting thought. Of course, can't be verified, but that's what they feel. And so these pagans who have no knowledge, they don't even know about the book of Genesis, they all date their family trees back to Japhat, Japhat, Jufat, Jupiter, Japheth, they all go back there. Well, let's look at verse 2. It says that this Japheth guy had some sons. Who are the sons? Well, Genesis 10.2 tells us that the nations that descended from Japheth begin with Gomer. Gomer's descendants, history tells us, are identified with the Cimmeranians. They first settled on the shores of the Caspian and the Black Seas. We know right where that is today. That, that the, that's the area where they say that they found... Evidence of Noah's flood. Of course, the people that are looking for it don't believe it was a global flood. 
They don't believe it was a universal flood. They believe it was a local something about the glaciers spilled over the Bosphorus and put 600 feet of water. But it's interesting for them to even think in a biblical way. But these people, these Gomer's descendants, left the marks of their presence as they left that area and spread across Europe as far as the Atlantic. In the German records, you find listings of Gomer. They were later driven out by another family we're going to meet in just a second, the Elamites. And the prophet Ezekiel, during the time of the captivity, talks about them and calls them, living in northern reaches of Europe, he calls them the descendants of Gomer. So in 600 B.C., when Ezekiel was writing, the 6th century B.C., he was looking out and he saw these people he identified as the descendants of Gomer, the son of Japheth. That shows how close this is in history. These people also, the, the Gomer descendants, appear in the Assyrian records. If you remember, the Assyrians are the ones that camped outside of the, the uh, city of Jerusalem and the angel of the Lord came and killed 185,000 of them. You remember that story in Hezekiah and Isaiah and all that? These uh, Assyrians bumped into these descendants of Gomer uh, and called them the Gemaria, and they defeated them under King Esdrahan, the Assyrian, and they wrote about it and all that and, and all. But here's where it gets interesting. The people of which are called the Ashkenazi, do you know today... When a Jewish person comes from Germany and goes to Israel, what do they call him? An Ashkenazi Jew. Ashkenazi is the name given to the descendants of Gomer. And that's what the Jews picked up on, and they called Germany Gomer or Ashkenazi. So it's just a fascinating similarity, and we can go through Jeremiah and everything else, but the, the scriptures say that this Gomer, which which the Jews today say is Germany, and they even name the people there descendants of Gomer, Ashkenazi. The Bible says those people in the end days are going to be unfriendly toward Israel. Well, if, if uh, the 40s are any indication of what the Germans think of the Jews, I mean, they are very unfriendly, right? Hitler and the concentration camps. Number two, look at the second one, Magog. Magog is in chapter 10, verse 2. Magog, in history, was a fierce and warlike people ruled over by princes who bore the royal appellation of Gog, which would be like Pharaoh or Caesar. Their descendants were the Scythians and their territory, the Caucasus Mountains. Do you know anything about where the Caucasus are today? That's the former Soviet Union. We're talking about Russia. And the Scythians, by the way, from the north, from Russia, made their furthest south penetration and actually conquered part of Israel. In fact, to this day, on about the third day when you go to Israel, you go to this ancient city called Beth Shean or Beth Shan. And that's where the Scythians made their furthest south penetration. And so the Scythians were stopped at that city. And of course, that was part of the Decapolis in the New Testament in Christ's time. And so these Magogites, which today are identified with Russians, came all the way down to northern Israel, where they're going to come back. That's why Ezekiel saw them coming back. They had already come down in Ezekiel's time and defeated, or were defeated, uh, just south of the Sea of Galilee in this town called Bethshean, but they receded back up into the mountains of the Caucasus. But prophetically, Ezekiel said, I see them coming back in the last days, which is a, a prophecy of Russia coming down, and he says, They'll be terribly defeated on the mountains of Israel. Verse uh, 2 has a third name, Madai. Madai, the third founding father listed, has descendants thought to be the Medes, as in the Medes and the Persians. And these people are linked always in history with the southwestern shore of the Caspian Sea. You notice I keep talking about Caspian Sea, Caspian Sea. In a minute, I'm going to talk about that because the single largest discovery of oil and gas in recent history, worth trillions of dollars, was found right in that region. Isn't it significant that where God has said, my enemies of my chosen people Israel, the enemies of Israel from the north are going to be coming down from this Caucasus and this Caspian region. And those people have historically been very poor. If you know anything about the Russian history, they've been the rich nobles and the poor peasants. 
And they've, even today, the Russian army, I mean, the poor cursed submarine that sank, blew itself up, or whatever happened, because they don't have enough money to even maintain their boats. Those people are sitting on trillions and trillions of dollars worth of hard goods in the recent discoveries in the last two years. Well, so Madai is the Medes, also in this area of the Caspian Sea, which would now be lined up with uh, the the Persian or the Iranian people of today. Number four, we find him in, in verse uh, two. Javan became the father of the Greek peoples. He moved over across Turkey. Tubal found a home in northern Armenia. Again, this is just the archives of history. Today, that would be identified also northern Armenia, you know, uh, the, the Georgian people that live up in Armenia and all that. I'm not talking about Armenians, theologically, but Armenians over by Mount Ararat and up north of there. That's also Russia. Uh, Meshach, number six in verse two. From history, we find that Meshach found, his descendants found their home in northern Armenia. Again, that would be the Russians. And this uh, Tiras uh, family is thought to have been an ancestor of the Thracians, uh, these are people that moved over the, if you know the Thracians, they lived in the Taurus Mountains, and the Taurus Mountains are where Paul had to go when he's going on his second missionary journey. And it says that he went from Antioch, where the church was, where we read about Barnabas and John Mark, he went up to Pisidian Antioch, it says in Acts. And Pisidian Antioch is the Taurus Mountains or the Thracian people. Okay, now look at verse 3. Having listed the seven founding fathers, Moses now goes on to describe the seven founding families of the European culture. In Genesis 10.3, the first named is Ashkenaz. Now, this is, this is the, the Gomer descendant. Jewish commentators believe his descendants are found in Germany. To this day, Jews from Germany and Central Europe are referred to as the Ashkenazis. Secondly, in verse 3, this Riphath family he gave his name to the Riphathian Mountains in the northern part of the Caspian Sea. And is it coincidental that perhaps the largest discovery ever found of gas and oil, worth trillions of dollars, is found in the same region? I mean, isn't God amazing how he's stacking the proverbial deck to make these people feel increasingly powerful and, and growing? There's going to be a growing anti-Semitism in the world. If you think the 40s was bad, the future will be worse. The 40s, at least there were a few places that the Jews could find refuge. In the end, there's no place they'll find refuge. So God opens his own refuge and protects the Jewish people, and we already have covered that. But that's part of the cards being stacked. Togarma, also in verse 3, is generally identified with the Phrygians, the Cappadocians. Now you say, where did I hear that? Well, don't you remember Peter? To the elect scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. 1 Peter chapter 1, those first verses there. So those are the, the people that live in that area. The Togarma people are the Phrygians, the Cappadocians, the Armenians, and of course that's up in northern Turkey. And isn't it interesting that right now the Turkish people have a defense agreement with Israel? I mean, the Turks and the Jews are united? Yes. I mean, they share technology, they share weaponry, they share joint military exercise. I mean, a Muslim nation, a secular Muslim nation, Turkey, is helping the Jewish state? Yes. And the Jews are falsely trusting in these alliances they're making. And someday, Turkey, Togarma, will turn. And Israel will be humbled as they've shared some of their delicate technology with their own enemies. So Ezekiel 38 and 39 records the same crowd, the Togarmites, the Magagites, the Meshachites, the Tubalites, and the Gomerites are all to be members of an anti-God alliance of the last day, and they're going to be fueled perhaps not by trying to get, you know, you've, if you have, I collect old prophecy books. I, in fact, I collect books. And I have all these old prophecy books, and I've loved to read them, how they conjure up it's going to happen. And for years, they couldn't figure out why anybody would march on Israel. And so they said, oh, it's the Dead Sea. It's got so much fertilizer, everybody's going to want to march. And I thought, fertilizer? Who wants to march in fertilizer, you know, and get the dead sea salts? I don't think they're marching to get anything. I think they're going to have so much money, they don't need to get the dead sea. If the Caspian region gets fully developed, and it doesn't matter whether the pipeline goes across Turkey or it goes down through the Arab country or the Muslim countries, it doesn't matter. The money's going to flow into that region, and they're going to get more and more very heady and more and more 
anti-Semitic and more and more Muslim-oriented, and they're going to say it's time to destroy that little speck that's sitting on our holy rock of, you know, uh, the Dome of the Rock, El Aqsa, and all that stuff. And so they're just going to go down there, and that's going to show the conflict of Ezekiel 38 and 39. We'll look at verse 4. We've only gone through a few names. The sons of Javan come next. They begin with this Elisha guy. This is folks from the Peloponnesus. That's in the Greek. Tarshish, we know about from the Bible. That's where Jonah was headed. That's Spain today, way over there. Kittim is Cyprus from history. And Dodanim, it's not only a funny name, it's an obscure, we're not sure. But whoever the Dodanim are, Ezekiel sees them coming against Israel. Well, real quickly, let me just go into verses 6 and 7. But the table next turns from Japheth's line. And uh, these nations, uh, which come to power after the fall of Babylon, and by the way, the Japhetic, the descendants of Japheth, have controlled the world ever since Babylon. Babylon was a Hamitic, a descendant of Ham. The Babylonians are from Ham. The curse, remember Canaan was cursed through Ham? Up until Babylon, Ham and his descendants were running the world. Babylon was a Hamitic empire. But after Babylon fell, Japheth has been the global rulers. If you look at it, it's the Western Asian and the Europeans who have basically run the world ever since Babylon was fallen. And I'm talking about the Persians, the Medes, the Greeks, the Romans, and now, of course, the, the Russian and the Europeans with America are the global leaders. All of them are descendants of Japheth, just as the scriptures portrayed. Well, let me just quickly do the Hamitic races. In the early dawn of human history, the descendants of Ham were the most vigorous and aggressive people. They were the earliest empire builders. They controlled human destiny. They are listed, starting in verse 6, Cush, that's probably... Uh, family that settled on the upper Nile. He is most generally identified with Ethiopia. Some of his descendants might have migrated to Arabia and Babylonia and India. And as I said, they, the Hamitic people spread out into other parts, but first they went south. Mizraim, also in verse 6, is the father of Egypt. Uh, the word is dual and embraces both Egypts. In fact, the original name for Egypt was Chem in history. This Phut uh, founded the nation of Libya on the African coast, and then the last one name where we'll pick up next time is Canaan. There's something significant about Canaan. In fact, we'll see later that Genesis 15:16 says that God had a uh, clock ticking on Canaan because that's who he cursed. He cursed not Ham, but his son Canaan. And he cursed him for the sinful act of his father, but he cursed the Canaanites and they lived it out, and we'll see that when we come back, and we'll see how Abraham fits in that. Well, enough of that. Let me just say this. Why should we study Genesis chapter 10? Because God is the one who weighs the nations. He's written the past, he's working out the present, and he shall accomplish the future.